Hello, everybody. It's a noon, and you are hopefully here for the intro to environmental law series, uh, the one-on-one for how to make the most out of the Yosemite Conference, which is coming up this week, Thursday, kicking off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Kim Bick, and I'm a former Yosemite co Conference co-chair uh, and current vice, uh, well, current secretary, incoming vice chair for the CLA Executive Committee. We have with us Paige Sambianet, did I pronounce it wrong? I probably should check that beforehand. She can tell you the correct pronunciation, who is an uh, associate at Sahagi Law. Uh, and we also have Nell Green, uh, Green Nelson, like you, Nell has gone off the screen, I don't see her anymore, who is one of our co-chairs of the conference uh, that's coming up and she's put a lot of work into it. And the three of us uh, are going to walk you through the not to be missed aspects of the conference, take your questions and make sure that you feel comfortable with how to make the most of the programming and the networking events that are at the conference this year. Uh, so with that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Nell and let her um, begin with the presentation. And we do encourage you to please uh, ask questions. You can do that through the chat and uh, we will answer as many questions or all the questions that we can get to. Uh, we are leaving a really good uh, period of time at the end for to take all the questions and uh, don't hesitate to put those in there. All right. To two minutes. Um, <laughs> thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, so we, we will um, we'll start with me um, here giving an overview of the Yosemite Conference. Um, then we'll move on to Paige uh, talking about how to get the most out of attending. And then we'll touch on some um, other ways to get involved in um, the environmental law section um, and, and take your questions um, at the end here. So um, just a little bit about the, the conference overall, oh, and also myself. So yeah, I'm Nell Green Nyland. I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment at UC Berkeley School of Law. And um, I am one of three planning co-chairs for the Yosemite Conference this year, which has been very exciting and a, a lot of work, but really interesting work. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, kind of touch on the general structure of the conference, um, then talk about many different types of events and activities that it has to offer. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up by mentioning some tips for using the conference platform. So this chart um, is kind of busy, but it gives sort of a visual summary of uh, the different types of events and activities that are going to be available during each day of the conference. Um, so we tried to keep the same general structure and spirit of an in-person Yosemite conference, um, but taking it virtual. Um, so this means that it is four days long. It starts on a Thursday and it runs through Sunday. And um, you'll notice that a lot of the, you can see the panels and the plenaries, a lot of the sort of legal educational content is loaded into the kind of morning and early afternoon time periods of each day. Um, and then other things happen in sort of the, the later afternoon and evening. And this kind of mirrors the, the um, form of uh, usual in-person Yosemite conference where there's lots of opportunity to take advantage of the wonderful environment in Yosemite, Yosemite go for hikes, um, learn from, um, from uh, park rangers and others in, in outdoor um, programming and things like that. So, that's, that's sort of the general structure. Um, and so first, um, kind of focusing on those sort of educational events um, that you might think of as kind of the core of the conference, but are complemented by other things as well, as we'll see later. Um, so on this uh, 30th anniversary of the conference, our theme is looking back, looking forward. Um, so educational uh, sessions are going to kind of be considering how past actions have gotten us to the present moment exploring the latest developments in environmental law and um, looking towards the future. There are three main types of educational events at the conference. Um, these are the plenary presentations, well, where there will be sort of one main speaker or a pair of speakers for um, kind of everybody at the conference to, um, to uh, sort of attend at once. Then there are panel sessions um, and finally outdoor presentations, virtual outdoor presentations. So here's a slide that kind of shows uh, the, the plenary presentations. These are the, the, first, um, the first thing I've mentioned. So three of these are gonna be offering MCLE credit, which is good to know. Um, on Thursday, the first day of the conference on the far left here, 
we're going to open with a plenary session on Department of the Interior priorities um, with Janaea Scott, who's one of the top lawyers in the U.S. Department of the Interior. Then on Friday at lunchtime, we're going to be joined by Dr. Carolyn Finney, who will be speaking about being black and dreaming green. And she's also the author of the book that we're going to be talking about in our book club discussion at the conference. Um, on Saturday morning, we'll have Amy Cordalis, um, who's the principal at the Ridges to Ripples Conservation Fund and a member of the Yurok tribe. She's going to be presenting on tribal sovereignty and the critical role of tribal governments in climate resilience efforts in a, a plenary um, talk called Native America, the Beautiful. Then finally, at lunchtime on uh, Sunday, Associate Justice Ronald Roby, um, Third District California Court of Appeal, will be talking about the evolution of the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, 50 years after its adoption. So this year's conference is also going to include 23 different panel sessions, all of which are offering MCLE credit. Um, so you'll notice from this slide that um, there's always going to be either two or three panels running simultaneously, so concurrent panel sessions um, during each presentation time. So this is a really busy slide, but just to give you a taste here. Um, so there's 23 panels, 17 of them fall under sort of five major subject matter areas. Um, air quality and climate change, energy, CEQA and land use, toxics, waste and chemicals, and water. And then we have sort of a, a nice batch of cross and disciplinary panels um, that kind of bridge across these different subject matter areas. The conference also includes four of what we were calling outdoor presentations. Um, so if you were at Yosemite at an in-person um, conference, um, these might be something where you go to a place in the park um, or outside the park and get to um, be in the natural environment. We're trying to bring a little bit of that to you here. Um, we, we have uh, one each afternoon, and these are kind of designed to help us learn more about the history, ecology, and management of Yosemite National Park. Um, these are presentations by expert national park staff, um, and in one case, a UCLA researcher. They're gonna be examining um, topics, including how birds and other animals respond to fire, efforts to protect endangered fishers, which if you're wondering, are mammals that are in the weasel family, um, the role of Chinese Americans in Yosemite's history, and finally, efforts to restore habitat along the Merced River. So in addition to what we, I've characterized so far as the educational events at the conference, I mean, really everything is educational, but um, uh, each of the, and, and I should mention that each of those educational events is gonna wrap up with an audience um, question and answer session. Um, that is sort of chat based. So you'll, you'll offer your questions through chat and then the speakers can respond to them. Um, in addition to those, there are many opportunities for sort of more extensive participation and engagement with your fellow conference goers. So these include virtual offerings um, like coffee chats, a book club discussion, a law student reception and virtual trivia and socializing, but they also include several in-person regional events. So let me just show you, this is sort of the landscape of all of these, these um, kind of more participatory and en engagement oriented activities um, that you can see here, uh, both virtual and in person. And then uh, kind of to take those apart here, um, first I'm gonna point out the coffee chats, which are this nice uh, brown color to remind us of coffee here. Um, every morning and afternoon, there will be virtual coffee chats um, held each day. So members of the Environmental Law Section's Executive Committee will be staffing each coffee chat and are there just to um, be resources. Um, and everyone uh, should feel free to stop by, mingle with the Executive Committee members and every, all the other attendees who, who um, come to the coffee chats. You know, these are a good place to kind of discuss events you've already gone to or are considering attending, ask questions about the conference or the section, learn about events happening later later that day, and then just generally to, to sort of find out about other conference goers. On Thursday and Friday evenings, there's also several great opportunities to engage virtually with other attendees. So first on Thursday, the first um, evening of the conference from 5 to 6 p.m., um, we'll be having that book club discussion um, that I kind of alluded to earlier. So we have uh, author Carolyn Finney, who will also be giving that separate plenary talk. Um, She's going to be joining us for a virtual book club discussion of her 2014 book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors. Um, even if you haven't finished or, or even started um, the book, I want to uh, tell you that you are welcome to come to this book club uh, discussion. 
we expect it to be a lively um, discussion about um, the book itself and more generally about how systemic racism has um, shaped cultural understandings of the great outdoors and determine who should and can have access to natural spaces. Um, later th Thursday evening, there's going to be a virtual law student reception from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And note that on my chart, I actually show it as only 7 to 8 p.m., so it's a little abbreviated here, but it's from 7 to 8.30. Um, students, um, young lawyers, and others who are new to the field, um, this is going to be a great opportunity to meet one another, um, to meet environmental lawyers, and talk about career pathways, and just have some fun. Um, and everyone is welcome, and we definitely hope to see you there. Um, then on Friday evening, uh, we're going to have a virtual tri trivia and socializing event, which should be great fun. Um, so there's also going to be several opportunities for in-person engagement, if you're interested in that, and um, you're kind of close to one of these regional events. So on Friday afternoon, um, attendees in the San Francisco Bay Area can in, um, join an in-person tree tour that's led by Friends of the Urban Forest. Um, this event is a recent addition. Um, to the conference and it's kind of more a, a parallel event that's going a, a, along um, site it. Um, but if you're interested in participating, you can contact Allison Torbit, um, A-P-O-R-B-I-T-T at nixonpeabody.com for details and RSVP. Um, and if you don't catch this email, feel free to, to email um, us or the, the environmental law section and we can get you that information as well. Um, on Friday, I have a cat who's meowing in the background, apologies. Um, on Friday evening, the Sacramento County Bar Association, Cancet Bridget um, LLP and Danny Brand LLP will be hosting an in-person cocktail hour at House Kitchen and Bar in Sacramento. And then finally, on Sunday afternoon, after the final outdoor presentation and sort of to wrap up the conference, um, we have a couple of beach cleanups um, for folks who are in Los Angeles or the San Francisco Bay Area. And there's information about those um, on the conference website. So just a few more things I want to mention, um, and the, kind of this last category of events, I kind of mentioned educational and then sort of participatory and social events. This category, I think they all kind of overlap and blend, but this one I'm going to call um, inspirational. So uh, I, I think that these, these um, events, I think, are, are sure to provide inspiration um, for everybody, I hope. Um, so early Saturday evening, uh, we'll be presenting the Lifetime Achievement Award to this year's honoree, Clifford Lee. Um, learning about him and his career from people who know him well and hearing him um, from him in a fireside chat. Um, Cliff is now retired, but he had a long and storied career, um, most recently as a Deputy Attorney General of the California Department of Justice. Additionally, um, we're really excited to be presenting selections from the Wild and Scenic Film Festival for the third year. The festival seeks to inspire environmental activism and a love for nature through film. So the conference is going to include both um, a kind of a showing on Saturday evening that we're calling the Bear Showing. Um, it includes some adult language and challenging themes. And then there's also going to be on-demand access um, starting actually the day before the conference on October 13th and running through the day after the conference on October 18th to a cub showing um, that's appropriate for younger viewers. Um, and you can see what films will be screening on the Wild and Scenic Film Festival's website. We are actually listed there as a, as a, a virtual event. So this is kind of just showing that Lifetime Achievement Award and the film festival showing on Saturday evening. Um, so you can find out more about most of the events and activities that I've mentioned on the Yosemite Conference website, and that's, that's listed here. Um, you can also find it um, if you go to the CLA Environmental Law Section website, it's right on our, our homepage um, there. On the website, you'll find a schedule. This is just sort of a, a screenshot of part of that schedule um, for each day that shows event titles, um, the type of event you'll see in green, this little um, box here, you can see the, the Department of Interior Priorities plenary. Um, it shows the speakers. Um, if you click on um, one of those titles, it'll take you to a page that shows the event description, speaker affiliations, and more. Other pages of the website let you browse um, speakers, uh, sessions, and sponsors, and also provide tips um, on family resources for attendees with children or who are young at heart and want to find out more about Yosemite. Um, I also have a uh, law student resources page with tips for law students, and registration is accessible through this, um, the website as well. So just um, this is, uh, again, a screenshot that's too little to read. I'm sorry about that. But it's um, just showing you sort of that law student's resources page. And um, 
it, it, it gives suggestions for how to engage before, during, and after the conference. Um, the before included uh, the, this 101 series. Um, and I've talked about an, a, a lot of the things that are included in the sort of during the conference um, as well. Um, I've already mentioned the Lost in Perception book club and coffee chats. I did want to um, point to one of the things that's on the uh, how to engage after the, the session. Um, and that's this um, uh, basically we'll be hosting a post Yosemite conference um, Zoom social for law students, young lawyers, and lawyers who are new to environmental law. And um, the law student resources page will be updated with a date, time, and registration info when that's available. Um, I'm going to end by sharing a few tips on using the conference platform, um, which is FeedLoop. Um, once you've registered and received login information, you can log in and explore it. Um, a few features to note are the public chat for each session, um, which won't appear until you're actually in that session, so you can't explore that ahead of time. But this is where you'll ask questions um, for speakers during plenary panels and outdoor presentations. Um, there's also an improved private chat function um, that is available through the conference platform throughout the conference platform and has a video chat option. Um, this is an improvement over last year when I think people, if they tried to use that chat option, it would kind of dump you out of the, the program you were watching and it was not such a fun thing. So they've, um, they think they've got that worked out uh, for this year. Um, and there's uh, basically most of the panels and outdoor presentations, um, just uh, as an FYI, are actually partially pre-recorded um, to make sure that we don't have some technical difficulties when doing this uh, rather large conference. But there's going to be a live Q&A um, during the last uh, 15 minutes of each of those sessions presentation time. So whether you're attending a partially pre-recorded session or a fully live session, um, the, the session will, will proceed as if it's live. So if you join a, a session 10 minutes into it, into its presentation time, you'll be joining at the 10 minute mark. Um, last year, there were some issues where if you join late, it would start playing at the beginning if it was a pre-recorded presentation. And then some people wound up missing, um, unfortunately, the, the live Q&A portion at the end because they hadn't caught up yet. So this is a way to um, address that. Um, if you're planning to acquire MCLE credit, um, I'm guessing many, many people are, um, unless you're a law student, uh, please note that a pop-up window is gonna appear about 10 minutes into the presentation time for sessions that provide MCLE credit, and you'll need to respond to that um, to, to get the credit. Um, a really helpful feature um, I, that I think is pretty wonderful is that all conference registrants will be able to watch recordings of the panels, plenaries, and outdoor presentations for 30 days after the conference ends. So this is really helpful be, um, in case you know you have a meeting on Thursday during the middle of a panel that you really want to go to and you can't make it, um, or if the, you know there happen to be um, during a panel session you really really want to watch um, multiple panels that are being held at the same time. You can do that. You can do that later. Um, and so, and my understanding is that you can also get CLE credit for watching um, watching those things later during that 30 um, day time period um, when you. Uh, start a recording um, after the conference ends, but in that, that time window, um, it should again pop up about 10 minutes into the presentation, that MCLE um, uh, pop-up box as well. So I think I'm going to stop there, but as you, I hope you can see this year's Yosemite Conference has a lot to offer. Um, I hope you'll attend and take advantage of the opportunities, not just to learn um, from what I call the educational events, um, but also to engage with other conference goers and to get inspired. Um, so thanks. Uh, I guess I will pass it on over to. Um, well, before you pass it on, we did have one. Oh, question, yeah. And I hope oh, sure. with more questions, but one question is whether your slides would be available um, on the conference's website or if we can provide them. And I think that's a great idea. And I think we just need to coordinate with CLA. Yeah, I think we can definitely provide them to, um, I'm guessing, um, uh, Yessi, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we can definitely provide them to um, folks who um, are participating in the webinar today. Um, and if, if, if not, um, my email is at the end of this, then feel free to email me and I can send them to you. Um, but I, I'm guessing we can do that. Yeah. Okay, now we can hand it off to Paige. All right, hi everyone. <clears throat> my name is Paige Samblinay and my pronouns are she, her. I am a first year associate at the Sohaki Law Group. And prior to law school, 
I was a scientist at an engineering company and my focus was in water quality and water resources and some solar project development as well. And I was, I also did some work in Kenya as a biologist with a team of scientists prior to law school. So clearly I knew going into law school that I wanted to pursue environmental law. However, you know, I'm a first generation law student and I wasn't from California originally. So I had to make sure that I knew how to navigate this space and essentially how to integrate myself into this network of environmental practitioners. And one of the best ways that I was able to do this uh, was the Yosemite Environmental Law Conference. So I went all three years of law school and at that time it was in person at Yosemite. And this year, as well as last year, it makes it even easier for everyone to attend. Law students, first year law students, new attorneys and you know people that are interested in attending because it's virtual. And I know that some first year law students don't know if it's actually possible to attend your first year, but I do think that this, if this is an area that you're interested in practicing in, or if you may be interested in pursuing a career in environmental law, the conference is an incredible way to meet people and to get updates on resource areas and in general, just to learn so much that can help you in your career. So I'm going to kind of give first time attendees and law students some tips on how to make the most of the Yosemite conference. And so we'll go through some tips prior to the conference, um, what to do and what not to miss during the conference. And then of course, following up on what to do after the conference. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before the conference, uh, there are a few things that you can do, you know, to kind of help solve some of the initial unknowns about the conference. So you can actually focus on the conference when you're there and make the most of it instead of trying to figure out some of these initial questions. And again, these are just tips. And essentially this was the process that I did prior to the conference my first year. And it helped me to really connect with people. And ultimately in some ways is some of the reason why I was able to find law clerk and employment opportunities afterwards. Uh, so first, you'll want to attend or review the Environmental Law 101 series or any introductory materials that you have, um, especially for resource, interest, uh, resource areas that you're interested in. So I did, before the conference my first year, I did a little bit of a refresher on some of the resource areas that I was interested in, and I did that prior to the conference. And I think that really helps to ground yourself for when the conference starts. Um, a lot of the panels are about specific updates or issues within resource areas. So having laid the groundwork to be able to understand and keep up with the content of the panels, I think really helps to get the most out of the conference. Um, and if there is a specific sub subsection of a resource area, that you're interested in or want to know more about that you don't have materials for, I'm, I'm sure you can reach out to any of us and you know, we'll try our best to find resources for you or at least you know, point you in the right direction to get those resources. Um, I also think that reviewing the list of speakers, and I'm not sure if we get an attendees list, I think we do before the conference or the day of the conference, uh, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but regardless, I know that, you know, reviewing the list of speakers, I think is crucial, you know, knowing that who the speakers are and what they practice, again, helps you to ground yourself and helps you to identify who you'd like to connect with at the conference. And uh, something that I will get into in a second that I did, and again, you know, not everyone has to do this, but I personally I'm not a natural networker, so I like to try to help myself as much as I can and prepare myself for networking. Uh, but something that I did was I would highlight in my brochure or make note of the speakers that I was interested in connecting with 
Um, so I would go to their bios on, you know, their websites where they worked. And sometimes if, you know, I really was interested in their career path, connect with them on LinkedIn beforehand, um, just, you know, note some, a few things about their practice areas so that I could help myself to have a more fluid conversation when the time came for that during the conference. Uh, but again, you know, not everyone has to do that, but I do think reviewing the speakers beforehand is important, at least to get a little bit of background on their practice area and probably what they'll be talking about during the panel. I also, another thing is identifying the topics of interest and questions you have. I think that is a, another key thing to do prior to the conference. Um, obviously the conference helps you with this initially because you get to choose the panels that you wanna attend. But I think even within topic areas, trying to find what you really initially think you'd be interested in is a great way to start to hone in on people you'll be looking to connect with at the conference and even more to topics that you can research into more to lay that groundwork prior to the conference. I also like to identify initial questions for some of the panels and I personally would write them down and 99% of the time my initial questions were answered within the panels which was nice to almost create you know an active outline of my favorite panels and some key things for me as a student, at least, to remember. Uh, lastly, which kind of encompasses all the previous, but I think is the most important, is identifying goals for the conference. Uh, as a law student or a young attorney or a new attorney to this space, this conference can seem overwhelming because there is so much information and so many incredible and extremely experienced practitioners. Uh, and while feeling overwhelmed is very understandable, you also have to realize that the conference is a place where essentially once a year, you have every resource you would want to jumpstart your career and it's at your fingertips. So I think the biggest question for you is kind of what do you want out of it? And so I would create a list of goals. And so for my goals, it was essentially, you know, one of them was to connect with at least three practitioners a day that I could really see myself forming good relationships with and being able to have them become a, a part of my network. Uh, another goal was to meet other law students or new attorneys, because essentially I would, those would be my colleagues when I became an attorney. And Maybe another goal would be to, you know, learn about a new topic area that you're unfamiliar with. And those are the type of goals that help you to have a mission for the conference. So you don't go in, you know, so overwhelmed and you have a game plan going into the conference. Uh, next slide, please. So during the conference, most important part, uh, I recommend attending the coffee chats. I think it is a great way to connect with others and it's a, a very low stress, casual environment. Uh, last year, I went to almost every virtual coffee chat, I think. And I was you know, able to meet new people and grow my network and have some really great conversations. And it's just a great way to talk with people outside of the panels, especially for new young attorneys or law students. You know, it's a great way to make, meet people in the field over some coffee. Uh, sometimes those coffee chats would also lead to me reaching out to someone on the feed loop chat function, uh, which I definitely think that people should utilize. Uh, it's essentially, you know, a private chat between you and another attendee. Uh, so I would, you know, either follow up from a coffee chat and continue a conversation with someone or find someone that I had highlighted previously from before the conference and, you know, essentially reach out to them and discuss how I would love to learn more about you know, the resource area. And the chat function, uh, it also has a video option. And so I use that a few times as well to connect with other law students at the conference. So it's just, again, a great way, a non low stress environment to be able to meet people and connect and be able to grow your network. Uh, the thing that I did uh, that I think is probably the most important during the conference for me essentially was to execute my list of goals that I had set prior to. And for me, one key example uh, that I wanna highlight is I would 
keep a list of updates throughout my years of law school on key resource areas that I was interested in. And I thought this was particularly helpful because, you know, when you're in law school, law school, you're a, or a new or young attorney uh, to this field, even I think keeping up to date with your family is sometimes even difficult, let alone, you know, key updates to specific resource areas. Uh, so for all three years, I essentially would go to the conference and it's all the updates that you could have for the last, for the previous year. And so I had a running list for all three years of updates for certain practice areas that it became al almost a refresher course for me. So I would use that. I would look at it, you know, before interviews or before networking events or even before the conference as a refresher. And it just helped to remind me, you know, what is going on in the environmental space. Uh, so make sure to attend those updates for specific resource areas. And, you know, if you want to keep a running list like I did, I think that's great. Obviously, keeping notes, making notes of important things is a great way to just make the most out of the conference and have, you know, key takeaways that you can keep with you. And I do think attending the social events that Nell listed earlier is another great way to just kind of acclimate to this space and to get to know a bunch of other very seasoned attorneys. And so I think that attending all of the social events is great. I went to the trivia night last year and I had a great time. If you're in an area where there is a in-person event, you know, I think I would encourage you to go. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So after the conference, of course, following up with the connections is ideal. And I know that um, for law students in general, it may be, it may seem a little intimidating, but you know, everybody has been in this position and following up with contacts and growing your network is one of the key things that you should do in this field. Uh, and I know that previous, prior to the situation that we're in where, you know, we can't always meet in person, it was a lot easier because meeting over Zoom is sometimes a little difficult, but I do encourage students or new attorneys uh, to start to meet people in person when you feel comfortable and as things start to open up. And we are always you know, ready and willing to have a coffee chat with someone looking to break into this space because it really is a familial kind of uh, area and we're all very excited to welcome new attorneys. I think attending other section events is a great way. All of the book clubs, uh, all the books in the book club are incredible. Um, any other, the diversity conference, some of the other events that we, that we hold throughout the year I think are great ways to, you know, get involved and do things after the conference. I think Nell mentioned the post Yosemite, Yosemite Zoom social is another great way to, you know, kind of have a debrief and a wrap up. And it's essentially for, you know, young new attorneys, law students. It's essentially a way to just get to know each other better and kind of have a debrief. And the last thing that I will mention is the Diversity and Inclusion Fellowship for law students. I cannot speak highly enough of this program. Uh, I was previously a diversity fellow my first year of law school, and I think it is a great program. It's essentially eight to 10 weeks at you know, a government agency or a public interest organization, and uh, each fellow gets a stipend. And so it's essentially a paid summer to work at you know, the nonprofit or government agency of your choice. And it's not only being able to pay your way through that summer, but you also have a mentor and you have these curated events for the fellows. And I really think it helped to propel my career and help me get to a place where I was comfortable reaching out to, you know, very, very seasoned attorneys and people who I wouldn't necessarily be able to have, uh, in-person contact with. And so I really, really encourage everyone to apply for the fellowship if you're a law student. And I can't speak highly enough of it. If you have any questions or want to talk about the student negotiation competition or any of the other student events, you know, feel free to reach out to me or 
any of the executive committee, I'm sure, can speak upon this as well. So, yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, I think we just have a few a few more slides. Oh, go ahead, Kim. Yeah. No, I just want to say thank you so much um, to, to, to Paige for that. Um, do we have more questions? I'm not seeing more questions, but I would like folks to ask questions. So um, we do have some more time. So did you have anything else that you wanted to throw in there now, or do you want me to pepper you guys with a few questions? I think um, I'll just mention that we have a few more slides, which um, I guess, again, um, Yessie has um, confirmed that we'll be able to provide um, everybody who's attending with the slides uh, that mentioned some of those things that Paige was talking about, ways to get involved. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all we have. We do have our email addresses here, although that's a very dark blue, apologies. Um, <laughs> I think other than that, we can I can stop sharing and we can just do questions. Does that work? Sure. Yeah, so I wanted to know if, if there was, uh, if, if you were a new at attendee, maybe this is a good question for Paige. If you were a new attendee, this is your first time, what would be a can't miss, or more than one can't miss <clears throat> item that you would, you would definitely want to make sure that you could do? Oh, that's tough. So I love going to everything and I try to do everything, but I do think that Probably one of, I think, the most useful things besides going to, you know, there's always great content within the panels and the plenaries and all of that. But I do think at least attending one of these social or uh, coffee chat events, I think, is crucial just to get to know everybody outside of the panels, you know, because I mean, it's great to everything, as Nell said, is educational. But I do think that making those connections and continuing the conversation afterwards is sometimes the most difficult part. So I think that's crucial is attending those low stress social events, uh, any one of your choice, really, there's multiple. So I think that would be the most important thing for me personally. I, I agree with that. I, I always, I will say at the in-person events, I find that's the most valuable aspect of it, besides getting CLE question credit and learning a lot. Right. Meeting new people is always really, really fun part and important part for your career as well. Uh, now, do you have anything you want to add as far like one of your can't miss? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I like Paige. I kind of like everything. So it's hard, <laughs> but I, I will mention that um, I mean, sometimes maybe, you know, if you're, if this is the, your first time at the conference or, you know, you aren't thinking about it that way, you might not think about attending the Lifetime Achievement Award presentation. Um, you're like, ah, that's just somebody getting an award, but it's really great. And you get to learn so much about um, the winner, the, the honoree um, who has an amazing career. Um, and it, I think it really, I don't know, it's just neat to, to hear that much about one person. Um, who has done some amazing things in their career and, and their you know, personal life usually as well. But um, so I would really recommend um, thinking about, uh, you know, attending that, that Lifetime Achievement Award um, presentation as, as something to mention. Um, yeah, I think that's a good one as well. Yeah, and I will say personally, I missed it for the first uh, number of years. I, I think I had that a view now. I was like, I don't have time. There's other things I could do to network, you know, with people. Uh, or to hike, you know, when we were in person, and I just didn't prioritize that. And when I did prioritize it, and I did go, I was really mad at myself for having missed the years prior because, and I've gone ever since because it, I learned so much, and I was really inspired by the person who won. Um, and I also was really inspired by CLA for valuing that person and and awarding them. Uh, the honor. So I, I do highly recommend that. And it does seem to be something that kind of flies under the radar uh, a lot. Uh, and so all of you that are out there that haven't been before, make sure you go to that if you can and tell your friends not to miss it as well. Um, okay. And then I had a couple other questions. So that I think, I think some of these might be outdoor uh, activities slash speak speakers, but I'm, I'm just curious um, what the Merced River uh, one was going to be on on Sunday afternoon. I mean, oftentimes people kind of get tired by Sunday. So I know we always try to put something on Sunday that's 
super, super exciting that people definitely want to participate in and not miss. Um, this is probably a good one for now if you know what that one's about. Am I, am I going to stump you? It's, not, it's, it's like, it's a, a stump the question. You're not, you're not stumping me per se, but um, I was just going to look up the actual um, um, explanation for, let me just see here. Um, it, it, I'm not sure like, you know, if it's exciting in terms of like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I've never heard of that before. But honestly, I think um, it should be really, really interesting. Um, uh, I think that Merced River Restoration, I think is with, um, if I'm remembering correctly, because I can't multitask, I'm having trouble looking this up simultaneously. But um, the uh, Catherine Fong, who I think is a, a, a hydrologist with the National Park Service, um, will be talking about their efforts to um, basically do ecosystem restoration along the Merced River. Um, and I think one of the great things about these outdoor presentations, um, which again, you're going to be joining, you know, virtually from your, from your, your chair somewhere, but um, we often get to see, um, you know, I, I guess I don't actually know the context in which Catherine will have been uh, recording um, her, her presentation, but um, we often get to see a lot of the natural environment in Yosemite, which I think is a really, um, sort of wonderful thing to get to do. And I know that that's the case, I think, for the Merced um, uh, restoration um, uh, presentation. I will, how about I will, maybe you can ask another question and I will, if I'm bad at multitasking, well, while you're asking the question, I will look it up and I will paste a, a link to the description in the chat. I, I wanted, I, one of the reasons why I was, I focused in on that and you picked right up on it is because I think what's really cool about this conference is we always highlight something that's happening in Yosemite or histor historical aspect of Yosemite. So we really pay homage to the location where the conference is taking place. And even in this virtual environment, we're still doing that. And I think it, what's great is that so many of us who even, you know, we don't have to travel to Yosemite now to have this great experience and learn about what's, what's there. Um, so that's just a, a bonus uh, little description of why Yosemite Conference itself is so fun. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, do the webinars cover mostly Fed and California environmental law, or is there a discussion of any other states? And I can say in the past, we have had some discussion of uh, other states, uh, in particular Pacific Northwest. We had a natural resource damages case that we focused on. And we've had some other cases that are, might be in other states that we believe will have implications for California. But for this, this particular year, I would defer to now on that. Whether there's um, anything from other states. Yeah. Year. Yeah, so so um, I think there are there there are a lot of things that I think are of interest um, in many states. Um, I I think that uh, there. I mean, so one thing our first plenary the, to kind of open up the conference is on the Department of the Interior priorities. So it's more federal um, federal level, but kind of uh, I think Janae Scott will be tying that back to um, sort of California's uh, goals um, and experiences. Um, but uh, so one of our uh, first uh, sort of air quality um, related panels is, is on, again, sort of the federal, the Biden administration, a breath of fresh air, question um, mark. We have a lot of things I think are just really broadly ap applicable, you know, looking at the, a carbon free electric grid. Um, some things are going to be pretty, you know, more specific to California, but could have lessons for other places. So looking at um, uh, managing resource impacts of meeting California's affordable housing shortage. You know, that's California focused, but I think there'll be lessons for elsewhere. Um, I'm trying to think here. There are, yeah, so so one of the, the panels is on, on clean beauty, regulation of toxic chemicals and cosmetics and personal care products. And that's certainly um, a topic that's going to be uh, of interest, you know, nationwide. Um, that, a panel on natural approaches for sequestering carbon and then kind of a a pair, um, uh, a, a, a panel that's kind of a complement to that one that looks at um, more engineered approaches to um, to uh, stabilizing um, climate. Um, so there's a lot of things I think are really broadly applicable. Um, yeah, getting to zero emission transportation by 2035. I mean, certainly, let's see here. Um, yeah, I mean, so we, we have uh, 
every year we tend to have a legislative update, which I think does sort of focus on the California legislature. Um, but we also have a judicial update um, that looks at recent environmental law developments in the U.S. Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the California Supreme Court. So that, you know, is, is going to be pulling in um, federal level things as well. Um, environmental justice from advocacy to action. Um, that's definitely of interest nationwide. Um, and then there are, you know, other things that I think, again, like, are California specific, but will have broader interest. There's legal and policy mechanisms and challenges for addressing California's aging oil and gas infrastructure. Um, recent developments regarding fine particulate matter um, for air quality, grappling with the plastics waste crisis. Um, I think that these are, you know, sustainability law and practice. They're, and then, and they're, they're, they're just kind of a range of things. We also have a panel sort of kind of in the water realm that's on pandemic public financing fallout looking at public water system finances and consumer debt, which I think will have um, broad um, interest. Um, uh, lessons learned from environmental bankruptcy. Um, yeah, we have, we have a real range of things. Sorry to, to go on and on there, but I was just scrolling down through, through a lot of the, the topics. And I think we do have a lot of coverage for you know, both California and, um, and sort of the rest of the nation um, that I think could be, uh, you know, of interest to people who may not be in California. So, you know, feel free to, if you are not in California, um, please attend anyway um, and let others know who are, you know, may not be in California or practicing in California. We, you know, this conference has a lot of great content for, um, for everybody. Definitely. I think, you know, probably what, there's probably not going to be necessarily a, uh, like, Looking at the code, Oregon code, for example, that's not going to happen. But uh, there might be some case law in other case in other states that would be applicable across the board or applicable in California. And there might be some California cases that would be applicable elsewhere as well. Okay, we have uh, can we follow the outdoor presentations online recorded. Is it live or is it recorded? Another question. So I think all four of our um, outdoor presentations. Um, this year are um, gonna have that pre-recorded for the main body of it, but they will be available for the live Q&A at the end. Um, and so um, I will be interested to see, I haven't um, checked in with the folks who are helping out with the recording. Um, there may be, they may be recording in the natural environment or not. Um, I know we had some of that last year, but you will be able to um, watch those just like you would watch a panel presentation or, um, or a plenary, um, a speaker event. Um, and then those also should be available um, during that 30 day period afterwards um, to, to watch. So I think answering it, you can follow along live um, uh, during the conference, and then you can also watch them later um, at, during that 30 day window. That's great. Uh, the only thing you can't really do later is the social events and the coffee chat. So I think and those are the things that, in my view, are the are can't miss to the extent you can afford the time for the trivia night. That's really fun. Definitely get in there to as many coffee chats as you can because different people come to different coffee chats and uh, it's only 30 minutes out of your day. So it's, it's a really valuable opportunity to check in, see people's faces, um, make connections, and then follow up as Paige recommended. Uh, I also really loved Paige's recommendation to look people up in advance. That's just really good practice. That's best practice for networking. And I'm really impressed that Paige suggested that. I didn't learn that until very recently and I'm getting late in my career. Um, and I think you're right, Paige, that it takes away some of the fear factor of networking. Yeah. Uh, you feel pre prepared. And you also impress other people when you do that because you have information about them to ask them about. And it makes them more comfortable and have less fear too. I guarantee you everybody else is just as scared as you are uh, when they're networking. Do we have yes. no. um, what have can you I also can I yeah, go can ahead. I add something on that? So um, so they're not all up yet, but we have requested um, and we have, and I know the web team is loading them. We will have um, if you go to the conference website link, um, there is sort of a speaker section, um, and you can look at the speakers for, e for each individual event, and there will be, um, hopefully by the time the conference starts, but um, hopefully a little ahead of time to help preparation, there will be bios and photos 
um, shared for our speakers there. So I just wanted to mention that, but, um, but they not quite sure on the timing there. So it doesn't hurt to actually look at the entire list of participants. Uh, this is something that I know consultants do when they're going to these conferences. So in advance, look at the entire list of attendees. I've done this in the past too. I highlight the people that I know with one color. I highlight the people that I want to know in another color. And then I'm always surprised when I get to the conference or when I'm participating online, when I meet new people that I did not identify and I'm really glad that I met them and wonder how did I miss, how did I miss that person on a piece of paper? You can't really know everybody by looking at a piece of paper or looking at online. So be open and eager to meet new, new people. And, um, and, but you can also plan ahead by looking at who the attendees are. Uh, do we provide that? Is that provided in advance? Or is it in the feed loop? I think it's in feed loop, actually, once you so get- So for the speakers, yeah, for the speakers, you can actually look right now. I put a link in the, uh, the chat to the conference website um, and you can see all of the speakers. I don't believe we will have a list of um, the, all the attendees, which is usually a much bigger universe, but you can, you can see the kind of the full, um, the full list of speakers is available at the, there's kind of a speaker section um, if you look across the top of the website. But you can also, if you look at the schedule and you look at a particular event, you can click on that event and you will be able to access the speaker um, information from there as well. I do recall last year that when I went into FeedLoop, I could message people and in order to message people, you can list, see the list of attendees in that way. Uh, so that, that is- Yeah, really I think you're, you're totally right about that. I think they're not a not ahead of time, but I think you're right about that. Um, although I'm not sure if that's changed at all. I think you're right. You probably don't want to do it ahead, too far ahead anyway, because a lot of people wait to the last minute to register. So that's right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to. It, it's we only have seven minutes left. So if anybody wants to ask a question, you have two amazing people here that know everything that you know about how to navigate the Yosemite conference. So I see Miles is on the attendee list right now. Miles, you're not able to jump in with your voice, but type in something if we've missed anything that you think that we should have included. See if I get Miles to type anything in. So in the one thing about the coffee chats is 30 minutes long, so it's very short. And I think that it's useful when you jump into the coffee chat is as soon as you have an opening, make sure you introduce yourself. Um, and, and hopefully the person moderating the coffee chat will then, or will already have introduced you or asked you who you are, or where you're from. Um, and we'll introduce you to the other folks, but don't be shy. This is part, part of this event is getting to know each other and we can't get to know you if you jump in and don't say anything. So please do offer up, uh, you know, it's always interesting to see where people are from. Last year, we had quite a few international attendees, and that was fascinating to me. We hear their stories, and uh, you know that doesn't usually happen in Yosemite unless it's an LLM student who is able to travel to Yosemite. But we had a lot of people from all over the world that were logging in. That's really cool. Um, and we also have people from out of California. Uh, logging into these conferences now too. It's a little difficult to get to Yosemite again if you're coming from you know, New York or Vermont, but uh, we, we can do that. So you'll meet a lot of people from across the country as well. Uh, just in general, the attendees tend to be government employees, uh, NGOs, uh, law firms, big and small and medium size and law students and consultants. So you have a, from all all points of view, um, defense, plaintiffs, regulators, regu reg you know, yeah, the regulated and the regulators, uh, and policymakers and legislators. So it's, uh, you get a lot of different perspectives. And I think that that's what makes this conference very unique, uh, in my opinion, based on other, con compared to other conferences. Uh, on law professors and academic researchers, thank you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of my favorite parts as a first year attendee is learning. It's almost reverse engineering where you want to get to. You can find different pathways. I could do this. I could go to a firm. I could 
go, you know, the academic route. I could go work for government and it's kind of seeing how they got there, I think is one of the most useful things is reverse engineering. Okay, these are the steps you took to get to your career. And now let me try to do that, which is another great thing to ask when networking for all the law students is kind of, you know, how did you get to where you are? What steps did you take? Because it's it's really useful when trying to navigate, you know, all the options for environmental law. People think it's one. People think of environmental law as just oh, just it's just one thing. But no, it's all these different resource areas and all these different opportunities. So it's really great to have the conference and be able to help to navigate that and see your options. And lawyers love and to talk about themselves. So if you ask them, <laughs> how did you? Get yeah, to and I was gonna I was gonna put in a plug for the the. Um, law student reception on Thursday night, which is, is explicitly going to have this, this component built in. There will be, um, I know there are a number of us who are on the Environmental Law Section Executive Committee who are committed to come, and hopefully we will get other um, conference attendees who both are and are not law students, and we will um, be able to kind of uh, break out into to groups and people will be able to discuss and ask questions like that. Um, kind of like, how did you get to where you, you know, where you are and what was your path? Um, so that, uh, that's just another plug for the law student reception. <laughs> yeah, remember your path, the paths sometimes become like spider webs, they're not direct. Um, the, I would say one more little plug for law student uh, networking is, to follow up and stay in touch. I have had a lot of law students reach out to me at, at, a, at the conference and after the conference. And a few of those have stayed in touch through the years. And uh, you know, I've been able to really help them um, find their way, like Paige is saying, navigating how to get from point A to point B. And sometimes it takes, sometimes it changes and sometimes it just takes a few steps. And uh, so I would definitely stay in touch with the people that you meet that you find are um, you know, aligned with what your vision is for what you want to do, or even if they're not aligned, just learn from everybody. And even if you don't know what you want to do and you're just mildly interested, I think this can be a great way to hear about, you know, the different, um, the different opportunities that are out there. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think people change their mind. I know I did. Uh, and I know, you know, a lot of people that I know did not go straight into this practice area and stay doing the same thing all the time. Uh, one of the things I love about the environmental law practice is it does cut, cut across every practice, every type of legal practice. So um, yeah, definitely don't feel like you're, you have to know anything right now. Um, so we are two minutes out. I can give everybody two minutes back of their day unless anybody, do you have any closing thoughts, Paige? I mean, I'm just very excited to meet all these new people. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, I'm a first year associate, so I don't have, I don't hold the power that the other two on this call do, but um, I'm willing to help, you know, as much as I can. And I'm very excited to meet everyone. Don't sell yourself short. You're a very powerful <laughs> woman. Now we have one minute. Do you have anything you'd like to close out with? Um, just kind of what Paige said. I, I hope you'll come um, to the conference. Um, we'd love to meet you. Um, and think about getting involved with the environmental law section in other ways. Paige definitely did it. Um, I think Paige is a future, a future executive committee member. I can't imagine she wouldn't be. She's done so much work with um, the, the environmental law section already. And there's just, um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of opportunities and we'd love to um, get you involved. Yes. So, thank you so much, give, everybody. give us an email. Thank you, Nell. Thank you, Paige. And thank, thank you, you. Um, for coordinating this. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our virtual Yosemite conference on Thursday, starting Thursday. Or next Thursday. Next Thursday, starting next Thursday. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot myself a weekend. Yeah, everybody's going to be logging on a week. <laughs> next Thursday. Thanks, Nell. <laughs> sure. All right. Bye. Thanks.